I'm going to pray, and then we'll continue with the uh, studies in First John. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we honor you, we exalt your name. Thank you for your love, thank you for your message, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for life, thank you for seasons, sir God. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, as we come to your word, we ask in the name of Jesus, you speak to us by your spirit. May we be glad we came, oh God. Lord, open our hearts, oh God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak to everyone in the way, in the language they will understand. Be glorified, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So like I said earlier, we are continuing our studies on the first epistle of John. Last week, we underlined the fact that 1 John presents a practical teaching in the nature of God as light and the nature of humans, the sinful nature of humans. It goes to outline the biblical view of Christ. In that chapter, it describes for us Christ's humanity and his divinity. Also, it gives us a biblical view of sin. That sin is present. Say, so if, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful, is just. He will forgive us our sins and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But also, he goes on to say how sin affects fellowship. In the, uh, before we got there, I explained to you the purpose of writing the letter. John wanted the people that said, I write this to you that you might have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. But he's going to say that the presence of sin affects our fellowship with God. And when our fellowship with God is affected, our fellowship with one another is also affected. Also, he, he, he goes on to say that the basis of true fellowship with God and fellowship with the family of God is a personal relationship with God. Now, when, if we don't have a personal relationship with God through a faith in Jesus Christ, it is impossible for you to have fellowship with God. And when a fellowship with God is not there, it is difficult to have fellowship with one another. So today, I continue with chapter 2 with the same theme that the epistle stated in chapter 1, that God is light. So today, I'm just saying, I don't know, you may not... They try, they try to get these slides ready. So I may go, they're working on it as I'm preaching. So it might be that I will go ahead of the slides. But today is chapter two. We're going to do chapter two. So open, no Bible reading today. So open your Bibles. However, you have your Bibles on your phone, on your iPad, or in the paper form. Open your Bibles to John, first epistle of John chapter two. So instead of reading through it, then coming to talk about it, so we'll, we'll, we'll go through it section by section and then bring out a few, a few pointers from there. Are we in First John? So here in, second, in chapter 2, the apostle continues the theme he began in chapter 1. We say that God is light. And because God is light, there is a way to live in the light and there are rewards for living in the light. So that's the whole theme of, of, of chapter 2. Say, it's continued to say that God is light. And because God is light, those who are in light, there's a way they live. There are things they do that show that they are in the light. There are way their life flows out of being in the light. So, um, in the introduction, in the uh, outline of, of, of First John, I did say to you that it is not very structured. You won't get like a, a thematic discourse of issues or it's not very, very um, organized. 
So it goes up and down, up and down, and flows and flows in forwards and then comes, comes backwards. So it's not um, a, systemic, a systematic theology of things. But in chapter, two, in chapter 2, what I've done is to, I broke it into seven sections so that we'll just break our reading of it and then discussion. So the first section of it is um, Christ is our advocate. That's what it's called in verse 1 to 2. The second is uh, the evidence of knowing God. They say if we know God, there are things that show that we know God. So that from verse 3 to 11. The third part is the realities of life in Christ. That when we are in Christ, there are things that are, are ours. I would say realities or certainties that we have for being in Christ. In, 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 in the first session, it goes on to say, beware of worldliness. Even though we look, there's no, no structure here, but you can link the themes he's hitting here. He said, you are in the light. There are, because you're in light, there are t- certain things that belong to you for being in the light. Therefore, be aware of one because this does not uh, belong to being in the light. And he goes on to say, be aware of Antichrist. In the sixth session, I'm talking about being rooted in the truth. So after... Explaining all that I said, I, I want to encourage you to be rooted in him, to be rooted in the truth. And the last session will be just the uh, verses 28 to 29 when he said, because you're rooted in the truth, because you're rooted in him, there are benefits or rewards that come to you. Okay, so we're going to go rush through the whole chapter. I'm going to read verse by verse and then walk through it. I won't do too much commentary today on it, but I just want us to read through it. Number one, Christ our advocate. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice or propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, you, you see, when he said, my little children, again, he continues the fatherly and pastoral tune that he started in, in the beginning. And so that the later is generally pastoral, generally, generally uh, you know, fatherly. This is a, an, el- an elder, elder statesman speaking to his children. He said, my little children. The way, when he say my literature, one say because of his status as an elder, but also his endearing, uh, loving relationship to the people he's writing to. Say my little children. I write these things to you. Again, he state again why he's writing the letter. Say the purpose and desire for this teaching is that you may live free from sin. I write these things to you that you may not sin. Which means that it is possible to live free of sin. Somebody is shocked. Yes, it is. You can live free from sin. Because he goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 9, those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them and they cannot sin because they have been born of God. Now, if it is not possible to live a life that honors God on daily basis, he will say this. So it is possible to say, I write these things to you that you do not sin. Having been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, having confessed your sin, having your sins forgiven and washed away, say, it is possible for you to live in a state of right standing with God. But perfection is not expected. Hence, he said, if anyone sins. Are you understanding that? He said, I'm writing this to you so that you do not sin. So there's possibility for you to live a life daily that honors God. But say, if anyone sins, he didn't say when you sin. 
He said, if anyone sins. When he said, if anyone sins, he said, okay, the idea, my desire, the, the intention is that you do not sin. That's the idea, that's the possibility. But I'm aware that you're not perfect. That everyone, once in a while, people do stumble. He said, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus, the righteous. Which means that Jesus is sufficient sacrifice for every sin. Are you getting the point? When you believe in him, your sins are forgiven. And so because you are in him, if you sin while you are in him, the sacrifice he made on the cross is still sufficient for your sin. Which means that the price he paid, paid for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. That's why it's a complete sacrifice. He said, because he said he is atoning sacrifice. What the other versions uh, uh, use the English word propitiation. Propitiation is um, a word translated from the Greek word elasmos. Elasmos is sacrifice that bears God's wrath and turns it into favor. This sacrifice of Jesus pays the just penalty for sin, but also at the same time brings reconciliation with God. Did you understand that? You need to know this because if you don't understand this, the devil can just um, uh, play tricks on you. When you stumble, he will tell you you've messed up and you're no longer accepted. But that's a lie. He say, if any sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the righteous, which means that God forgives you on the account of Jesus Christ because he is the atoning sacrifice, propitiation for our sins. This is the point that he's saying, I'm writing to you that you do not sin. That it's possible for you to live a life free of sin. Romans 6, 14 says, for sin will not have dominion over you since you're no longer under the law but under grace. Maybe and that maybe in the next book we'll go to his uh, Romans, Romans. Because Paul, in, in, in the book of Romans, which is very, very thematic in the way he explained it, it deals with the issue of sin that all have sinned about and, and, and the saving grace in Jesus Christ. He said, But you can be free from sin because you're no longer under the law. Which means that being under grace is not a license to sin. He said, sin will not have dominion over you because you're no longer under the law, but under grace. Grace does not slave, enslave somebody. The law enslaves. He said, because you're under grace, you can live free of sin because sin is a master that dominates somebody. Hold the person bondage to serve one, the devil. So he said, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation for our sins. This sin, it pays the penalty for sin, but also bring us, reconciles us back to God. That if you sin as a believer, all you need to do is what he said in chapter 1, verse 8. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when he said that Jesus is the propitiation for our sin, the same theme is conceptual scripture. Romans 3, 20, 25 says, whom God set for, that's Jesus Christ, as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he has passed over the sins were previously committed. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, in this is love, not because we love God, but that he loved us and set his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
So he said, it's provision for us. He said, and John says, not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's like, imagine this um, elderly statesman talking to you as I'm talking to you now. And he's saying to them, the price Jesus paid is not just for our sins, those of us here, but also for the sins of the whole world. What he's saying, it, it, it doesn't mean that the whole world, will, everyone will be saved. Because forgiveness of sins comes only through repentance. One can only be forgiven. Their sins can only be forgiven through repentance. You can, you can, the whole of 1 John is a, is, you know, you know, repeats that theme. Chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, verse 23, chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 5, verse 12, chapter 3, verse 18, chapter 5, verse 24. They repeat that theme consistently. The sacrifice of Jesus for sin is available to all. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Jesus was given for all. His sacrifice is available for all. But it's effective only for those who repent of their sins and believe in him. Do you understand that? That's what Romans chapter 3 verse 25 says. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. Which means said, God sent Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Effective through faith. That means he paid the price, but only those who, uh, who receives the benefit of, the, of what he paid are those who accept the true faith in Jesus Christ. So that's why even though Jesus has died, he paid it for it all. But only those who believe in him will be saved. Those who do not believe will not be saved. Okay, let me go to the second session. The evidence of knowing God. I'm going to, I'm going to focus on chapter 3 to verse 3 to 11. Now, by this we may be sure that we know him. Underline that in your Bible. Say, by this we may be sure that we know him. What is that? He answers immediately. Say, if we keep, obey his commandments. He's saying that the evidence, the proof of that you know him is that you obey his commandments. Whoever says, I know, I come to know him, I've come to know him, but does not obey his commandments is a liar. I told you that the apostle is not politically correct at all. He calls it black and white. He says, by this we know that we know him if we obey his commandments. Anyone who says that I am in him but does not obey his commandment is a liar. And in such a person, the truth does not exist. But whoever, and whoever means whoever obeys his words, truly in this person, the love of God has reached perfection. By this we may be sure that we are in him by this, we may be sure. By this, we may be certain that we are in him. Whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk just as he walked. Let me just pause for a minute. He said, by this, we will be certain. By this, it will be evident. By this, it will appear to everyone that we know him, that we are in him. Whoever says, I abide in him, Whoever says that I am in Christ ought to walk, should walk just like he walked. That Jesus didn't just pay the penalty for our sins, but he gave us a pattern of how to live. That when we are in him, we have to follow the pattern of life that he lived. When he said, by this we may know, he answers the question, how can we be sure that we know him or that we are him? This means that assurance of your salvation is possible. It can be certain that you are in him. Second Peter, I think chapter 1 verse, from verse 3, 
down to 10, it says, um, his divine power has given to us all that pertain to life and bullets through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. It says, and hereby given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by this great and premature we will become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is the world through lust. He said, besides this, giving all diligence, paying every attention, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godly, to godly brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness love. Say, for if these things be in you and abound, you will not be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But an entrance will minister to you unto this glorious kingdom. Verse 10 says, Therefore, giving all diligence, make sure that your calling and election is sure. That you are certain that you are in him. So it's, it is possible, we say, by this we know. It is possible for us to be certain that we are in him. And John, he, here he gives us uh, two ways we can know. One is self-diagnosis. That you, you say you, 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 you diagnose yourself. How many of them have diagnosed themselves before? If I've done it. If, if your hand is not up there, you're probably not telling the whole truth. Because you, particularly, anybody ever consulted Dr. Google? If you consult Dr. Google, you are self diagnosing Okay. Let me not get sidetracked. But John said, in, look at look at verse 1, verse 7. Let me see if I can just, I just want to, I want you to see how, when he's talking about self-diagnosis, verse, verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. 2 verse 5. But whoever obeys his word, truly in this person, the love of God has reached perfection. By this, we may be sure that we are in him. 3 verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not abide, whoever does not love abides in death. Can it be more, 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 more clear? 4 verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts us fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. Chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Can you see, John is saying that we can be certain by self-diagnosis. I'm telling you that, that these are things when you see this in you, you, you obey his commandments, you love the brethren, you're walking in the light, you're you follow his way. When you do this, you know that you are in him. Secondly, by according to the ethical test. The ethical test. It's, you know, the question is, is do professing Christian has the changed life that keep the commandment? If you say you're a Christian, is your life changed? Or is it the same like as it was, it has been from the beginning? That's a problem. He said, if you are in him, then your life has to change. And this change will result in you keeping his word. If your life has not changed and you're not keeping his word, then you are not in him. So to, be, to know and to be in God means that we are in right relationship with God. Which translates into an obedient life. Obedience does not justify us. But those who are justified, they live a life of obedience. Did somebody get what I'm saying? 
you know, just because he say, I, I obey the word, I keep every word here. Being obedient doesn't justify you. Doesn't make you right with God. But those who have been justified through their faith in Jesus Christ, they live a life of obedience. So, to know him is to have a personal relationship with him that will translate into a, a, a practical, into a practical good behavior. So, if you're in him and you're still behaving badly, something needs to change. You need an update. To walk as he walked. Say, because he said that we, if you stay with him, we have to walk like he To walk as he walked is to mirror the life of love, the life of piety, the life of obedience, the life of sacrifice that Jesus lived. When we live that way, it gives us an assurance that we are in him. In Acts of the Apostles, it says in, 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 in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Why? The people around, the community around them saw the way they were living and said that these people are like Christ. Verse 7. Beloved, I'm not writing, writing to you a new commandment, but an old commandment that you, may ha that you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is, is the word that you have heard. Yet, I'm writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light, while hating his brother or sister, is still in darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light and such person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates, his, hates another believer is in the darkness and walks in the, in the darkness and does not know where, what, the way to go because the darkness has brought on blindness. It's the, John again is here, black and white. He said, I'm not, I'm not giving you a new commandment. I'm not writing a new commandment. So I give you an old commandment. The old command, what's the old commandment? Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you will not love your neighbor as yourself. So the old commandment is love God, love others. That's the old commandment. So Jesus in Matthew 22, verse 34 to 40, he affirmed this old commandment. He affirmed it and then restated it as the new commandment. That's why he says in John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. So what John is saying here, I'm not writing a new commandment to you but an old commandment. The old commandment that you love God, love one another. So the same old commandment, Jesus came, affirmed it, restated it as a new commandment. Loving your brother and your sister is the true evidence that you are living in the light. This is important because, you know, loving, what it's saying here, loving, one, loving your brother, loving your sister, is, is the unifying force and the identifying mark of a true Christian community. When you love your love one another, it, love is what unifies the Christian community. It's not just a unifier, but also it's identifying mark. What, that's what Jesus said in John 13, verse 35. By this, all men you know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. I go to the third session, verse 12 to 14. I call the realities of life in Christ or the certain things we have in Christ. Verse 12. 
I'm writing, writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young people, because you have conquered the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So here, John saying, okay, your sins are forgiven. You are in him if you live in, if you live in the light. Because you're in him, there are certain things that are realities for you. And I want you, I want you to be aware of them. He say, I'm writing to you, little children. I'm writing to you, father. I'm writing to young people. Again, here, a lot of, most commentators agree that this uh, represents stages of growth in the Christian, in Christian faith. Little children, young, young adults, old adults. So our knowledge and growth in Christ must be progressive. You see kids running around? And some of them, when, when they are small, yeah, two years, they are all clinging to their mom or to their daddy, depending on which one is the good one. <laughs> the one that doesn't say no is the good one. They are clinging to them. By the time they turn teens, they don't want to be around you. They are in their own world. Are you still 13, 14, 15? You still force them to go on holidays with you. By the time they are 19, even if you pay them, they won't go on holidays with you. They have grown. And let me just digress a little bit. And all these friends have made the children all their life. When they don't want to come home, they start crying. Let them go. They have grown. Release them. Don't hold on to them. <laughs> Let them be. But be there for them. When they come home, let them find food to eat. Okay, I think I, I've digressed a little bit. <laughs> so our knowledge in him has to be progressive. Has your Christian growth reached the maturity appropriate for your stage in life? You want to write that question and reflect on it and answer it? Has your Christian growth reach the maturity appropriate for your stage in life. John goes to say certain realities, certain certainties that we have in him. He says, I write this to you because your sins are forgiven. He's saying that when you are in Christ, you must know that your sins are forgiven. So that you don't go on living with condemnation in your, verse 2, chapter 2 says, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Your sins are forgiven. You need to know that because in your bad moments, when life goes, uh, something happens and you, you come to that place and then you're hearing this voice telling you that you're not good. We want you to know that your sins are forgiven. Secondly, like you know the Father. That you know God. Not that you know about him, but you know him. You know him not just as the one who forgave your sin, but the one who will keep you in him and bring you to his presence. You know the father. You know the one who started a good work in you, who will continue with you, and who will bring you to glory. You know the father. You know the one who is committed with you. It's not just that he's the alpha at the beginning, but he is the omega. But between the alpha and the omega, everything in between that he's the same God, you know the Father. So not just that he saved you, but he also is your sanctifier. He's, he's washing you clean. 
You're progressively becoming more and more like him. You know the father. He wants you to know that you know him. And he says, I write to you young people because you are strong. Proverbs 20, 20, I said, the glory of young people is their strength. And that's one of the ironies and tragedies I find in this generation, that young people are very tired, more tired than their parents. <laughs> but he said, the glory of young people is their strength. And the glory of the old is the gray hair. See, I keep shaving my hair because I don't want the gray to scare you. But if you have gray hair, say it is glory. But he say you are strong. And because you are strong, you are strong because the word of God abides in you. The word abides in you. That's what Paul speaking to the Ephesian church in chapter 20, Acts 20, 30 to say, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up. And give you the inheritance. When the word abides in you, it builds you up. He said, because the word abides in you, you are strong and therefore you have overcome the evil one. It is possible for you to overcome. I read um, chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. For whoever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. And who is this that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you get that? Say, because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you have overcome. So long as you're in this world, there will be trouble, there will be challenges. But you need to know that because you are in him, you can overcome. Because he has overcome for you. These are certain things. These are realities we have by being in him. And the apostle is reminding us to know this thing, to hold it, to treasure it. So when moments come, you will say, no, no. I, I, I get what you're doing. I get what is in front of me right now, but I, I know that I have overcome. And therefore, I will overcome. Whatever challenge it is, Whatever temptation it is, whatever, whatever sickness or hardship, whatever it is, you can overcome. Say, who it is that overcomes? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So if you believe in him, if you've given your life to Christ, if your faith is in him and in him alone, there's a guarantee, a certainty for you, you will overcome in Jesus' name. The first session, verse 15 to 17. When it says, now be aware of worldliness. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride of riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever. Do not love the world is not a rejection of the world, but a warning against devotion to worldly system that is opposed to God. James 4.4 4 says, adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is empty with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It's not saying that you get out of the world. But that you do not embrace the worldly system that is opposed to God. He said, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of the Father here is, 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 it has a double meaning. It refers to the love God has for his people, has for us. But also the love we have for him. One generates the other. God's love for us generates our love for him. 
Because in, in chapter 4, verse 7, it says, we love because he first loved us. We are incapable of loving him if not because he's loved us. While we're still in sins, in trespasses, while we're still rebellious, while we're still unregenerated, he quickened, he quickened us and caused us to respond to the promptings of the Spirit. And then we opened to the gospel and we received the gospel and we gave our heart to him and then we begin to love him. But before ever that happened, he is the one that quickened us in our depths of rebellion. So we love because he first loved us. When he says all that is in the world is not a demonization of the whole created order. And when some people see demon in everything, when God created the world, everything he said, he said it was good. Do you understand that? So, when you say all that is the world is, is not demonizing everything in the world. Desires are not inherently evil, but they can become twisted when they are not directed by God or directed towards God. Desires are not inherently evil, but when your desire is not directed toward God, when your desire is not directed by God, then it becomes twisted. So, this is where worldliness comes in. So, worldliness is both external and internal. External worldliness refers to the people we associate with, the places we go, the activities we enjoy. There's an external worldliness. If you, if you, if the people you hang out and there are people who are opposed to God, there are people that, and they are your best pals. I'm not saying you don't have relationship, you know, with people at work and all that. But if these are, these are people, your, your best pals and the people you get cancelled with, then something's quite wrong. If the places you go are places where even the demons are afraid to go. You know, just, just be careful about that. If the activities you in, indulge in are even the ones that people who are agents of the devil, they hide to do it, just be aware of that. So there are external worldliness. But what is it has an internal worldliness? Well, this has to do with the three attitudes that John described here. He said, one is the craving for physical pleasure which is the gratification of physical desires. He called it the lust of the flesh. Second one is the craving for everything we see, which is coveting, accumulating things, materialism. He called this lust of the eyes. Oh, you see this, I must get it. Whatever you see, you want to get it. That's lust of the eyes. And a pride in achievements or possessions, which is the obsession with one's status or importance, it causes the pride of life. When you're going to say, do you know who I am? Have you heard that phrase before? And they begin to tell the people they have, they, they have had tea with. These three attitudes are the devil's most effective weapon. In Genesis 3, verse 6, it comes to Adam. It says to him, to Eve, has the devil said? And so when Eve looked at the truth, say it was, what? Pleasing to the eyes. What's the next thing? It was good to the body. What's the next thing? He decided to make one wise. Wow. He went for it. In Matthew 11, verse 1 to 7, when the devil came to Jesus Christ, he used the same trick. He said, all the kingdoms of the world I will give you. Just... 
Only just, just a small thing I ask of you. Just, you don't have to, there's a part of Nigeria where people, they, they show respect, they will throw themselves on the floor. He said, you don't, you don't need to do that. You don't even need to put your knees down. Just, or just, just, a, just, just a little bowing down, and I will give it to you. The lost of the eyes. And then he was hungry. Say, command these stones to become bread. If you're the son of God. Lost of the flesh. I brought into the temple said, you know, you know, you're the son of God. You have all the powers. God is with you. Throw yourself down. He will give his angels command over you. I want you to begin to show your power. You can do this. Pride of life. It's worked. It's the good old trick of the devil. Some people in the secular world call it the three G's. I don't know why it is three G's. You know what they are? Girls, gold, glory. That's when they're talking to men. Some people say, oh, it's power. But the issue is that this thing works. The devil wants to get you in one of those ways. So we need to be aware of them. The loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are, when, when they are in you know, all, they are evidence that we are loving the world. So if you want to know whether you're loving the world or not, are this loss controlling you? Question I leave with you on this session is what values are most important to you? Do your activities reflect God's values or world's values? Number five. It says, verse 18 to 23, it says to them, beware of Antichrist. I'm going to try and round it up. I'll read this quickly. Children, it is the last hour. As you have heard, Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they make it plain that none of them belongs to us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And all of you have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Whoever, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one, deny, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Everyone who confesses the Son has the Father also. I just um, ex uh, highlight a few things here as I move on quickly. There are, there are some phrases you hear in the Bible, the last days, the last hour, the last time. Have you read those? When you say the last days or the last time or the last hour, it's, it's, it refers to the day of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, it says, this is the day of salvation. And the last days... The last time, the last hour has already come. We are living in the last days. This is the day of salvation. But when you hear the last day, it's talking of the, the day of salvation, that is the ultimate salvation and wrath. You see, that's the concept in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 to 11. That has not come. It's talking about the last time when judgment will be passed. That has not come. So last days refers to the period of time between Jesus' death and resurrection and the final judgment. So we are living in the last days. Is that clear enough? So the last hour stated here, you know it's the last hour, the last hour stated here started with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to clarify that. And when he said, Antichrist is anyone who denies the person of Jesus Christ is an antichrist. So an antichrist is, it is a denier of the incarnation of Christ. 
They represent the evil one. In John 17, verse uh, uh, 15, uh, Jesus was praying for the, for, for the church. He said, protect them from the evil one. So many antichrists refers to people who reject God's will and do the devil's bidding. Say, in the world there are many antichrists. So, if you're looking for people, I, I know people, you know, um, hear so many th- things on YouTube and all that, and people, you know, have so many ideas that they explain about what the last days and antichrists and all, all, all that. All that conspiracy theories. Stay with what the Bible, Bible says, if I just advise you. But Antichrist refers to anyone who rejects the person of Jesus Christ. Those who are truly say, he said, if they have been of us, they will have continued with us. What is the point? Is not making the uh, point here that those who are truly saved, those who are truly Christians, that they will continue, they will not abandon the faith. Because they will be kept by God. And John 10, verse 27 to 29, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. I give to them eternal life, and they will not perish. Say, no one will take them out of my hand, because my, the Father who gave them to me is bigger, bigger than all. In chapter 17, verse 12, when he was praying for the church, he says, all that you've given me, I've protected them. I've not lost any one of them except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And he's saying that every one that you give to me, I keep them. Otherwise, God is not able to save to the uttermost. So, when he saves, he saves completely. From salvation to glorification, he will keep you. Everyone who are in him, they will remain in him. They may stop, but they will come back to him. The anointing here refers to the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that leads us into truth and helps us to discern error. That's what Jesus was said in, um, um, uh, John said in, in um, in John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, the advocate, he will teach you all things. He will teach you, lead you into all the truth. So this, this here to just say that the, the, the religions of this world do not constitute many paths to the one God. For all except the Christian faith refuse to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Because someone say, say, what of this, what of that, what of that? If this is, if you're a Christian and this is the book of the faith, this is the testimony of this book, that every spirit, 1 John um, chapter 4 verse 3, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you've heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Okay, I'll wrap up quickly. Number six. So he says, say, let the truth be in you. Let the truth remain in you. Verse 24 to 27. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If, you. if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is what, we've, what he's promised us, eternal life. I write these things to you concerning those who would deceive you. As for you, the anointing that you have received from, the, from, from him abides in you. And so that you do not need anyone to teach you. But, his, but as his anointing teaches you about all things. And it's true. And it's not a lie. And just as, you, as he has taught you, abide in him. He said, what you've heard, what you received, abide in him. To abide in him, to have a close relationship with him. So let the word of God, what, what you be taught, let it abide in you. Colossians 3 says, he said, let the word of God dwell in you richly. To abide in God, his word must abide in you. And this is the protection from being led astray by, uh, by um, misleading beliefs. 
when the word abides in you, you will not be led astray. A rooted relationship with God and his words and the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit, they are the resources we need to discern and to ward off error. We need, the, we need to be rooted in him. We need the word of God in us. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit to discern error and to ward off error. The last portion, verse 28 to 26, 29. Say the reward of being him. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he is revealed, we may have confidence and not be put to shame before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right has been born of him. So here's what he's saying. That the visible proof of being a Christian is right behavior. But right behavior without faith in Christ is not acceptable to God. So, but a deficit of faith and right behavior will cause us to be ashamed at the last day. When we don't have faith in him and we don't have, uh, we don't have right behavior, when he appears, we'll be ashamed at the last day. Good deeds does not produce salvation. Is that clear enough? But they are the necessary proof that of a true faith. Good deeds does not give us salvation. But good deeds are the necessary proof of true faith. Because we are not saved by good deeds. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of work so that no one may boast. James, James 2.17 says, So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So we must strive for ethical integrity. But place our faith not in our morals. We want to live right, but our, we will not place our faith in our living right. Our faith has to be in Jesus Christ. So come to the end. I just one more verse I will read to you. That's, that will be my key verse here. Verse 14. I write to you children because you know the Father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young people because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. This is why John wrote. So he he's wrote to every one of us here, the young, the old, the very old, the very young, every one of us. So he wanted you to know that in Christ, your sins are forgiven. That if you're in Christ and you live like he lived, you walk like he walked, that you get your bearing, your compass, the way of living, your worldview, your filters for life, you get it through the word of God. He said, if you are in him, you walk like he walked. That by, do, by that way, people will know that you are in him. And when you live that way, you can be certain that when he comes, you will not be ashamed. Let's stand. <clears throat>